My guests today have both changed the world. Activist and actor Cheryl Lee Ralph was at the forefront of the HIV AIDS epidemic. Dr. Melina Abdullah is co-founder of the Black Lives Matter movement. They've joined forces to make sure laws are implemented to eradicate institutional racism. Say hello to Cheryl Lee Ralph and Dr. Melina Abdullah. Hi everybody, welcome to Hollywood Live. My guests today are two women who have always been at the forefront of our recent reckoning and really the revolution that's been going on for a while. My longtime friend, activist and actor, Cheryl Lee Ralph, and the woman that we are just going to call our new Moses, Dr. Melina Abdullah. Aww. Welcome to Hollywood Live. How are you both? Thank you. Very well, thank you. Good to be here. I, I, I've got to say, Dr. Abdullah, can we just do a little bow down to you, lady? I mean, you know, I have, I know that when you started hashtag Black Lives Matter, you were the co-founder, you had no idea this would be a worldwide reckoning. How does that make you feel? Well, thank you so much for the recognition. Um, so I'm co-founder of Black Lives Matter Los Angeles, which is the first chapter of Black Lives Matter. And you know, I'm a mom of three kids and, um, you know, a black woman living in black community. And, you know, when Trayvon Martin was murdered and his murderer was acquitted, we really didn't have a choice but to pour into the streets and to fulfill and heed what we call our sacred duty to, um, you know, no way that we could step into shoes of people like Mama Harriet Tubman or Ida B. Wells or Ella Baker, but we don't deserve to even utter their names if we're not doing as much work as we can to get our people free. And so um, we knew that we were stepping into that and committing ourselves to building a movement, not a moment, um, but no way could we have anticipated that it would be named the largest social movement in global history. Yeah. And that's because it was time. Sometimes things get caught up in time at the right time. Yeah. And there were so many things going wrong on our planet, and they still are. We're trying to rectify them with this current election. But in the process of rectifying them, you know, it was just that time. So we applaud you. We really, really applaud you. And it really comes down to legislation, too, because I don't care what you say. We all know that we can have all the movements we want. If we can't get a law or something, some piece of legislation is going to help us out. It's not going to matter. It's really not going to matter. And Cheryl Lee, I got it. You know, you have been an activist for so, so long, but you're also married to a state representative um, of Pennsylvania, Vincent. And, you know, as the wife of a state rep, you're very involved in politics anyway. You have been, you know, on both coasts. You what know, does that really mean today? You know, it's so interesting for me, you know, being married to a state senator, a senator who is also the chair of appropriations, who is also a black man and serves as the first black man to serve in that position. First of all, there's a lot of pride. I'm very proud of him and what he's been able to achieve. And in this election cycle, it has been all about raising the funds needed. And it's when you talk about fundraising, fundraising isn't easy, especially when you are in dire straits. And the Democratic Party on so many levels has been in dire straits to raise money to battle against the orange occupier in the White House. So to see my husband put to the task as the first black man chair of appropriations and to see him go way above what was expected of him, all I can say Hi. is that's my husband. That's Hi. my husband, Senator Vincent Hughes from Pennsylvania. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Feels good. It's, uh, it, it's got to feel good. But I, before we get into the discussion of this election, Cheryl, you know, I got to tell you, when the COVID pandemic, when we realized, you know, like in March, that this was really a pandemic worldwide, and this was affecting the way we come into the world, the way we live, and the way we go out of the world, all of a sudden, I thought about you, because you were so at the forefront of the HIV AIDS uh, epidemic 
and how we all worked really hard and all those PSAs that you always came in and did. And you know, it's now just a chronic disease that nobody talks about. What did we do wrong with COVID that we should have done because of HIV? Well, interesting enough, Dr. Fauci was very much a part of leading, you know, of leadership when it came to HIV and AIDS back in the day. Yeah. Dr. Fauci and all of the scientists tried to get people to understand, use a condom, wear a condom. It is a proven barrier to stop the spread of the disease. And now it's like, can you get somebody to wear one of these? Can we get people to wear a mask? It is a proven barrier to stop the spread of the disease. Can we get people to just agree wear a mask to protect yourself and protect others it's the least you can do back in the day people were saying about condoms they don't fit they don't feel good it's just not right same thing now with the mask i don't like it i can't breathe it doesn't feel good back in the day you used to say well i guess aids must feel real good huh well i guess now it's like Intubation must be what you want to feel good or having your family die sooner, quicker, earlier with no great send off that you can offer them because of the situation that we're in. What I have learned about this is that human beings will not stop being human beings. And the reason we have books like the Bible is to let you know that for thousands and thousands of years, people have been making dumb and stupid mistakes and paying the price for it. And no matter how much, how saintly they are and say they read it, they keep missing the chapters on how to do good, how to be better, how to treat others better. I'm like, what in the world? So yeah. what we didn't learn around HIV and AIDS is what we didn't learn thousand years ago about how to be a good human being. Yeah, well, I think we also didn't learn, you know, nobody's made that analogy, but you're absolutely right. Condoms, masks, you cover it up and it prevents the spread of disease. And it has almost literally, I mean, it hasn't wiped out HIV AIDS, but like I said, it's a chronic disease that a lot of people don't even bother to think about or talk about. Well, um, we will be celebrating the 30th annual Divas this year, which will be aired live on KTLA, virtual and live, Saturday, oh. December 5th. So, Oh, I love it. And I was so pleased to be a part of that very first one 30 years ago. I still talk about that. I know, I know. I can't even believe it's been that long. How, how, many, how did yeah. that happen? I but mean, let, my let's... God. That means my son is going to be 29 this year. Oh, my <laughs> God. Yeah, you don't want to know how old my kids are. They're older than me, so it's, we don't worry about that. And they are crazy about Dr. Abdullah. Girl, let me yeah. tell you, she lit a fire underneath them. I, I even think that she came and spoke at one of their events because they're just like that woman, that woman, mommy, mm -hmm. right there. I was just yeah. like so happy. Well, your Et son, Etienne, Etienne, right? Yes. I love Etienne and all that he's doing in his circle for Black Lives Matter. He has this walk for black lives that he does he shows up regularly to our events he's been just a tremendous force in this movement so whatever you did teach me so i raise my children the way you've raised him oh yeah. thank you thank yeah. you so much for yeah. that thank yeah you. I, I, and I think it's worth mentioning that Cheryl Lee's children, her son and her daughter, uh, we were talking about this earlier, have created really a space for young people to come and, and, and to shelter together and to, to express themselves all safely. Um, and it's all a part of the Black Lives Matter. So you're right. I mean, the, the younger people, I think that's the important thing about this. And they should have picked up on this because it's most of them or many of them at this point that are dying you know as a result of the violence in this racist system uh dr abdullah you know looking at just say the violence and, and the conversation around defunding the police what is your real perspective on that and what does that really mean in today's world sure so i mean i want to say unapologetically that we have been saying defund the police for the last six years Black Lives Matter is more than seven years old. 
Um, but when we think about policing in this country, it's really important that we understand that the form of policing that we have descends from slave catching. Come on and now. so it's really important that we understand that these outcomes are not accidental outcomes. They are not errors. Um, Manning Marable, the scholar Manning Marable, writes about how these systems were intentionally and deliberately designed to produce these outcomes. And so when we talk about targets on the backs of Black folks, that's what they come from. They were slave catchers who, you know, went out and tried to capture our ancestors and return them to their so-called owners. And so even though this form has evolved, their mission has remained the same. So I want to be very clear that we absolutely say that we have to transform the way that we imagine public safety. We have to reimagine public safety and recognize that what's brought safety to Black community has been the building of strong communities. It's been the knowing of our neighbors. It's been the provision of resources. It's been all of the things that have created safe community, no black person on the face of this earth that I know, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know anybody, any black person who feels safer when a police cruiser pulls up behind them in traffic. So what do we do to invest in the things that actually keep communities safe? And so defund the police came with a recognition of the history of policing, but it also came with a recognition that our budgets are moral documents, right? Our budgets are moral documents. And when you look at the budgets of cities like Los Angeles, we're spending upwards of 54% of our city's general fund on police. And budgets are also zero sum games. So when you spend 54% on police, you're not spending on housing. We have 60,000 unhoused people in the city of Los Angeles, and that was before the pandemic, right? Yeah. And so we need to spend on housing. We need to spend on mental health care. We need yeah. to spend on quality after school programs for our young people when they go back to school. They all need mental health resources in the midst of this pandemic. This is the kind of thing that we should be spending on. So defund the police is about pulling our resources away from those things that don't serve us and investing them, especially on the front end, on making sure that we all can live in communities that are safe and healthy and nurturing. And so that's what we mean when we say defund the police. Well, you know, it's interesting because here in Los Angeles, and I know we've got viewers from all over, all over the world now, but um, there, the, uh, one of the big races, of course, was with Jackie Lacey, who was our uh, district attorney, a black woman. Um, and because of her record and history, it appears that, you know, people, I know Black Lives Matter seem to not support her this year. Talk a little bit about that, because I know we normally like to support our sisters and whatever they're doing. And that's a very uh -huh. powerful position. Right. But sometimes, you know, you got to go on the side of what's right. And so explain a little bit about why you changed your position on, on her and, and why that. And I'm bringing this up because I think it's something that people all over the country are going to be looking at. Sure. So we heed the words of Mama Zora Neale Hurston, all skin folk and kin folk, mm -hmm. right? And so when we think about Jackie Lacey, the district attorney of the county of Los Angeles, on her watch, 626 people, <coughs> excuse me, have been killed by police. And she has refused to prosecute those officers. That is more people killed by law enforcement than any other locale in the country. And she refuses to prosecute law enforcement. And that's largely because we believe they have a deal. She doesn't prosecute them. They, they finance her reelection campaign. Exactly. And so <clears throat> we say that she has to go. So for the last three years, we've been demonstrating on the front steps of her office, saying <laughs> that she has to go. And we were called to do so by the twin sister of a woman named Keisha Michael. Keisha Michael was, um, she and her partner, Mark Quentin Sandlin, were sleeping <laughs> Excuse me. That's okay. Sleeping in the car in yes. Inglewood 
Yes. <laughs> in 2016, when five Inglewood police officers could, <coughs> couldn't wake them, and so they shot them to death. Hmm. And so Keisha's twin sister, Trisha, is the one who said, we can't just protest the police. We have to protest the district attorney who refuses to prosecute them. And so we're hoping that tomorrow will be a transformational day, not just ridding the White House of evil, but also mm -hmm. saying Jackie Lacey not only must go, but will go. Mm -hmm. And we're going to hold everybody accountable who has a role to play in the theft of life of Black people, including the skin folk who ain't kin folk. And remember this, Daniel Cameron in Louisville, Kentucky, the one who enabled those officers to get off on the murder of Breonna Taylor. Woo. He was also one of those happens to be Black people. Yes. White supremacy often uses folks who are Black descriptively, but don't authentically represent the collective needs of Black people, collective interests of Black people. And we believe Jackie Lacey is one of those folks. So she has to go. This is not personal. This is about the protection of Black life. It, it, you know, you are so correct in there. And I love the Zora Neale Hurston, uh, you know, the quote from her, because, hey, we still all stand on the shoulders of all those folks and all of our ancestors who have been out there, who were out there a long time ago. Um, the other thing, uh, Dr. Abdullah, that you've done, that I, I still find just amazing. And it goes to show how one or two or three people can make a huge difference. Um, you know, for years, we, the, part of the problem is that we have not been told the right history. We don't know our history half the time. And so for all of the people who have been going to school like myself forever and all the kids kept coming up behind us who thought that, oh, Columbus Day, because Columbus discovered America. We all knew that that wasn't the truth because we all knew, well, what about the Native Americans? Weren't they here 10,000 years before them? But anyway, that didn't seem to matter. So now, at least here in California, thanks to uh, Dr. Abdullah and some other folks, we now have an, an Indigenous Peoples Day, which mm -hmm. celebrates Indigenous people and not Columbus. And I know that there was a huge pushback from around the country, but you know, it's, it happened, it got passed and that's what we celebrate here. And now I've noticed that it's taken again, you know, it's picked up around the country. Could you just speak a little bit to that and, and the difference that those kinds of things that seem so small, but it's a huge difference. Sure. So I was really blessed to be appointed to the County Human Relations Commission. And um, our indigenous leaders in the county of Los Angeles had been demanding that we stop the celebration of Christopher Columbus, who was a colonizer, who was um, one of the folks who ushered in chattel slavery, who was um, a pedophile and a child trafficker, a, a sex trafficker. Um, we need to stop celebrating these kinds of folks and we need to uplift the people whose land we are still on. The indigenous people, the Tongva and Chumash, where I am in Los Angeles, this, they were the original stewards of this land. And it's important that we honor them. It's important that we remember that they're not some um, part of history and not here anymore. They're still here right? And it's important that we give honor where honor is due, not where white supremacy demands that we, we place our attention. And I think it's also a part of a larger effort to tell the truth about our history, to tell the truth about this country and this world. It's why I'm a professor of Pan-African Studies. It's why we have been pushing for an ethnic studies requirement, which we won in the K through 12 system here in Los Angeles, um, and just won through legislation, through a phenomenal legislator, sister legislator, um, Dr. Shirley Weber, 
Um, the Cal State system now is requiring of all of its students that it take at least one ethnic studies class because we have to unearth truth. When we do that, it empowers our young people to be the change makers that we need them to be. And it's also connected with the thing um, that I think both Shirley Ralph and I are um, committed to. I know that we're trying to transform who's in the Oval Office, but also there's some really important down ballot measures, including Proposition 16, Thank you. which will usher in racial equity Thank in you. this state, that we need racial equity, not just equality, but equity, fairness. We need to um, consider the ways in which Black folks and Indigenous folks and Brown folks make this country, make this state, make our cities great. That's who makes our cities great, right? That's who makes our country great. And so we need to um, do the work to make sure um, that we have racial equity in California. So we're telling everybody, as you go to vote out the evil that occupies the White House, as you go to vote out Jackie Lacey, make sure that you vote yes on Proposition 16. Right, yes. and for those who, yay, and for those who um, don't live in California, that really is bringing back affirmative action, which unfortunately got kind of voted out here in the state of California I know. and in many other uh, many other states. Yeah. Um, and what that really means is people think, okay, it talks about going to college and all of that. It does because if you look at now the college numbers, the the numbers for just say you know the Asian folks versus Black folks. And then you got Hispanic and white folks in between. 40% of the population of USC is Asian, not necessarily Asian American, Asians. 4% is black. And that's because we were not treated in an equal way and that's our right. students are not able to get into college. That's bottom right. line. I mean, and, and then and right. then it, and then it goes as far as because I have to mention this, you know, in terms of, of development and projects like that, it means that. If you are a big development or a big business person, you are not required in any kind of way to hire any minority. You don't have to, you know, and unless it's legislated, we know that they're not going to. So, yeah, we got to bring back affirmative action all over this country. Um, I know that the two of you are very busy and I'm so glad you're spending time with us. I just want to know, you know, the other big issue that unfortunately we are almost stuck with it and that is this very conservative supreme court which is at this point able to do so much damage i can't even speak on it but what would you suggest to people about how we are going to move forward with this new supreme court that we have one of the things that i would like to do and excuse me for just piggybacking on this proposition 16 is very important in a state like California, it is awful that UCLA, you have young black and women walking on campus and the first thing they say to each other is, what team you're playing for? What sport are you playing? Because that is how bad it is on just that campus alone for how they bring in young black people for higher education. Equal wages is, it's on the ballot with Proposition 16. The re why this proposition is lagging in a state supposed to be so forward thinking as California is beyond me. And I don't want anybody, anybody who's left over that has to vote, just vote yes on 16. Just vote yes on 16. Better education, better school schools, equal wages. It is necessary and it is important. COVID has pulled back the covers that lets us know that systematic racism is a very real thing. And the way you can fight it right now between today and tomorrow is by casting your vote. And I don't know about, I can't tell anybody who to vote for, but I'm praying for a blue wave. We must, <laughs> we must ask extra got to that orange occupier out of the White House. He, everybody that supports him, they must go. Barr must be disbarred oh. and exit the White House 
completely. What we see going on in America right now is a sin and a tragedy. Never in my life did I think that I would have children that are fighting the fight that I saw as a child in the 60s. I never thought that it would be this. I never thought that I would see poor white people in the South rise up with such blatant hatred and the use of the language to everybody. And for those who think it's just in America, it is spreading across the world. It is yeah. spreading to Canada. It is spreading to Germany. It is spreading to France. And what they've got going on as a, as a reaction to us and our behavior, it is costing lives costing lives oh, uh right now we're up past two hundred thousand, and they're saying by the end of this year if we don't get it together and wear those masks that we're going to talk about in a minute because you know cheryl lee's got some uh it will be up to three hundred and ninety nine thousand people by the end of december that's uncommon we're okay with it and that that's what bothers me we're okay with I know. it how can we see how? people dropping dead in these hospitals, suffering and dying. And we think it's just a hoax. It has nothing to do with me. Oh, it's not real. They're just making it up. I lost my uncle early in this. Mm -hmm. And he was so loved by our family, our community, his church. We didn't get to give him a proper send off that he deserved. Because in Corona, that does not exist. No, nope, it does not. And I know it's real because I lost my uncle. I have a friend, she lost three people in her family. I and lost three people this past week. So I, I really understand. I mean, three people in one week. Um, they're all friends that I grew up with from childhood. So it's like, okay, this is real. This is real. So yeah, that's, you know. And it disproportionately that. impacts our community. They're yes. estimating that almost 40% of the deaths are of black people. Come and on so now. this is a black issue. We have to stop acting like it's an equal opportunity um, hey. disease. It is not. And mm -hmm. everything else, every other form of racism exacerbates it. The fact that we have higher rates of diabetes because there's food deserts in our neighborhoods. Yes. The fact that we have higher rates of asthma because of environmental racism, right? Yes. Higher rates of stress, which cause hypertension, right? Yes. All of those pre-existing conditions are racialized pre-existing conditions. It's a pre-existing condition of racism. And so we have to make sure that we understand that this is also a race issue. It's a health pandemic, but it's yeah. also a race issue. And the economic fallout from it is also raced. They're estimating that 40 to 50% of black owned businesses will never recover from the economic fallout. And so we have to do everything that we can to bring an end to it as quickly as possible. We also have to develop our own strategies and say, how do we deliberately support black owned businesses? How do we engage in things like mutual aid to make sure that our people have self, uh, have, have healthy and clean food? I'm so grateful there's an organization in Los Angeles called Vegans of LA. It's a black owned vegan Yes. Um, black led vegan organization. They feed us. They bring us grocery bags to all the Black Lives Matter meetings. They bring grocery bags to Black women for wellness so that I never had a fruit called a, I forgot what this thing is called, some spiky fruit. It's delicious the though. Dragon. Um, dragon yeah. fruit. What are talking about? No, it's, it's called ca Rumble Time, a Rumble Time. It's, okay. it's delicious. And they passion fruit and all of these yeah. things that create help among us, right? We're not stopping at fast food spots, which are the only spots that are open now, 
right? We're eating healthy because we're helping each other. So we have to engage in ways. The same thing that's gonna keep us safe from police violence, the building of black community will keep us safe from coronavirus, right? The building of black community, the loving and care for each other. That's Which right. brings me back to my, my original question about the Supreme Court. Because what you just said is like, how are we going to get around what may be devastating decisions by our Supreme Court, um, including the Obama health care situation, you know, including Roe versus Wade, all those things, like, like you said, that affect us. And once that is legislated, we're going to have to go into some kind of action because it's not going to work for us. So what do we do? You mean having a lack of health care? It's yeah. not going to work for us. Absolutely. I'm sorry. No, you're right. That's what I'm saying. I mean, if the Supreme Court goes the way that we think they're going to go on these issues, they will eliminate what we now know is like how many 20,000, 20 million, I'm sorry, insured people with pre-existing conditions. It will eliminate that. And so, that goes right back to what the good doctor said. Once again, who will suffer the most? That's what I'm saying. Black and brown people will suffer the most. I remember when Barack Obama was in, in the presidency and people would say, well, he never did anything for me. And I would always say, if all he ever did was give you health care, he did a lot for you and us because we are not well. And we, as a result of COVID, have gotten sicker, as you heard from the good doctor, from all of the pre-existing conditions that we have carried. So I can tell you from my point of view, as a, as a health activist that you know I've been doing that for years, is one, we need to get right with ourselves. We need to get right with ourselves, our bodies, our minds, our spirits. We are so busy trying to figure out what we cannot handle and ignoring what we can handle. What can you have an impact on? Yourself. Yourself. You, you heard me say earlier, mental wellness, mental illness is a major thing we're going to have to think about going forward because COVID has taken people to a different headspace. Yeah, it really has. I, I, I got to let you both go, but I cannot let you go without uh, Shirley Rao sharing with us, you know, we were talking earlier when she always has the best lips, okay? Okay, so she's a Broadway actress, Tony nominee, you know, all kinds of TV shows and all that. Yeah, so she's had really great makeup and hair people all through these years. I'll just say that, but she always has the best lipstick. And now you're coming up with a whole new brand and you're coming out with it in, uh, for, in this month, actually. Tell us it, about it, that. Well, well, thank you so much. It's all about you know, this whole isolation and Corona, I made a choice for myself. I said, I'm not going to come out of this bitter. I'm going to come out of this better. So I got very creative. People kept commenting on my red lips and I started saying, well, let me create a line. So we came out with red lips. So on Thanksgiving Day, because I believe that Thanksgiving Day is a heinous holiday. It's one of those holidays to me, it's like connected to Columbus Day because a lot of people got hurt and died from sickness and illness. So I call it Thanks and Giving Day. I'm not going to wait for Black Friday. I say on Thanks and Giving Day, just go to Shop with Cheryl Lee. Shop with Cheryl Lee. For old school, it's www.shopwithcherylee.com and you can get your red lips, you can get the glasses that I was wearing, the lipstick, the satin velvet lip, all in shades of red, and get a connection to download my updated audible book, Redefining Diva 2.0. So you can read the book with your red <laughs> lips on and go into the holiday. Okay. I will definitely be getting my red lipstick just so you know, because you know, I, I love that. I love that look. Dr. Abdullah, thank you again for all you've done and continue to do. Um, is there anything, I mean, you've got so much on your plate. Is there anything you can share with us that might be coming up for you? 
Sure. So we are having a marathon party at the polls tomorrow. So if yes. you haven't yet voted, meet us in front of Staples Center. We're going to have lots of celebrity appearances. You should come out. You should come out. Um, I don't know if you're leaving the house, but come out. <laughs> We're having a, a marathon party at the polls. Um, we'll have music. We'll be socially distanced, but we'll be having great food and fun and telling people that even if you weren't pre-registered to vote, this has been a phenomenal voting period. Yes, because Anybody can vote. Anybody can vote. So if you are a U.S. citizen over the age of 18 and are not currently on parole, we don't care if you've been on parole before. If you are not currently on parole, um, you can come out and vote and you don't have to be pre-registered. Just come out to the Staples Center. You can walk in, you can register and vote at the same time. And then on Wednesday, we're going to be celebrating our victory that we're claiming in advance um, that Jackie Lacey will go. And so we'll be on her office steps on Wednesday at three o'clock. And everybody can plug into our work at Black Lives Matter on blmla.org um, and on Instagram, BLM Los Angeles, Twitter, BLMLA. And we need everybody in the struggle. Yes, we yeah. do. I think folks have jumped in whether they wanted to or not. Ladies, thank you for all you've done and will continue to do. We will be keeping up with all of your activities and, you know, stop by again. Let's, after the inauguration in January, let's all have a really big party. I'll, supply, I'll, I'll supply any amount of champagne that we need for that. <laughs> We're going to hold you to it now. Yes, we it's are. okay. I'm on. We're on. There you go. <laughs> Just in yes. case we can't, in case we can't all travel to the inauguration, which may be a little tricky. Um, we'll do yeah. our own part of the year. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'll be wearing that red lipstick too after Thanksgiving. There so you go. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.